Yeah, that's, uh, okay. that's Alandra, Dr. Alandra Magnus. Welcome to the Engineering Education Research Seminar. Thank you to everybody for coming. Um, uh, the, uh, for those of you who are registered for this um, seminar, the course, there is a syllabus, and if you haven't picked it up, I'll circulate that along with the uh, attendance sheet that's in a minute here. Um, I'd like to first... Uh, ask whether there are any announcements from Engineering Education, Graduate Student Association, SWC student chapter. No announcements? Sorry? Uh, are there any announcements? Uh, ASWE will be uh, co-sponsoring a seminar next week, so please come and stay afterwards for the ASWE portion of next week's speaker. Yeah. So next week's seminar we have that, is Alberto Rodriguez, from the, uh, um, who is the Mary Andrews Chair of Elementary Education here at Purdue, and that is sponsored by the ASWC chapter. Um, I'd like to thank the snack bringer today. Snacks were provided by Hoda. Thank you very much, Hoda, for stepping up. I appreciate that. If you value snacks, if you benefit from snacks, sign up to bring snacks sometime. I'm also going to uh, distribute all of these. These include the attendance list for those of you. Uh, we just like everybody to uh, indicate whether you're here so we have an accurate count of how many people come. Even if you're not on the list, uh, please um, enter your information so we know where you're coming from and which department you're from. Or, uh, uh, and if you'd like to receive announcements of our seminars by email, and who doesn't want more email, uh, indicates that by uh, including the email address. You're not required to do so, but it's, it's just nice to know how many people are here. So this has the snack time sheet as well as our attendance sheet uh, to go around. Today's talk is in boiler cap, so if you'd like to see it again, there will be a recording uh, posted online, um, and we'll try to provide a public link to that. If you're registered in the course, it just goes up in, in Blackboard, so you can see that. Uh, as well. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our sneak, speaker today, who is Chanda Dasgupta. Uh, Dr. Dasgupta just joined Purdue as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, he uh, earned his, uh, he was, comes to us from University of Illinois at Chicago, and previously he was at Georgia Tech. Uh, today his talk will be Improvable Model as Timing Artifacts and Student Engineering Design Activities. Thank you, Chanda. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so thank you all for coming to my session. Uh, to give you a context of this talk, so this is, um, so I would be presenting part of uh, a study that I did as part of my dissertation. Um, and this focuses on using physical models to engage students productively with the engineering design process. And when I say students, I, uh, this is specifically I engage with sixth grade students. So um, upper elementary. Um, and this goes back to 2012 when I started um, investigating how to engage students with the iterative design process, how to engage them systematically. And I could have given them a maker kit, asked them to design something and observe the process to see what they do 
and um, to kind of then form my own hypothesis, but they have very little experience with systematic design process. And um, I understood that they needed scaffolding. So I began experimenting different ways of scaffolding their activities. And this was part of uh, like a series of studies which I did. I, I followed a design-based research approach. And with every, every iteration, um, I refined the, res the research design as well as the, the scaffolds that I used with the students. So uh, the study I would be presenting today is the third in a sequence of studies. And it's focusing on the use of suboptimal models, or what I call improvable models to engage students um, productively with the engineering design process. But before we get into that, I... Okay. I want to engage you with a small activity for 10 minutes. And I would... So this is a group activity. I uh, need to get into groups of three or four. Um, and I'll start the timer once you get the design boards. You can be five in a group as well. I mean, And I have more pieces of the straws that are on your board. So if you need more straws, just let me know. Um, the idea is that every group is a small plumbing company, and you are competing with each other to get the best design. Uh, what I've given you is a suboptimal design of a plumbing system of a house, the board being the floor of the house. And there are three taps that you have to connect the source. The source is the bottom left corner. And every pipe piece has a cost associated with it both in terms of dollar as well as a pressure drop. So the table here gives the, both the cost. So the thicker pipes are the one inch diameter pipes. Uh, slightly uh, narrower than those are the three quarter inch pipes. And then the, uh, the thin ones, the coffee stirrer, those are the half inch pipes. And every pipe then has an additional cost of $100, but there's no pressure drop across the pipe. Uh, so what I want you to do is up, spend some time optimizing this design and figuring out the best way of connecting the source with all the three taps. Oh, and you have a maximum budget of $3,000. And there's a pressure constraint that every tap, it shouldn't fall below 10 PSI. So these PSI, it's not optimal. It's just one to the left. And that's one problem. And you can remove the CPs, which are there, which says 42 PSI, 5 PSI, 0 PSI. Those are the PSIs with the current design. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you change the route or change the I think those questions. Any questions? Oh, okay, ten minutes. Go. Thank you. 
seconds. Start wrapping up.
All right. <laughs> oh, ten more seconds. Then. Okay. Okay, I'll just ask yeah. everyone to add up what was the opposite. Yeah, so let's add up how many. Anyone else wants to share the final thoughts? All right, maybe if you have time later on, you can come back to the design. All right. I saw a lot of like um, interaction going on in between the groups, even within the groups. There was a lot of engagement on the design task itself. And like I heard, uh, groups trying to reduce bends. Um, you're trying to weigh the pressure as well as the cost to see if like you were able to get both of those at an optimal level. So I want to move on to the next one. Uh, next slide. The background for the study, like it's built on this idea of design optimization, which is very central to engineering design activity. And what it asks the students to do is make connections between variables. Those variables might be visible or invisible. For example, in this case, we use the plumbing system on a daily basis, but we usually do not think about what's inside the walls. So there are, there are connections to be made uh, in the plumbing system which are not really visible. And along with it comes the idea of making trade-offs. So when we are dealing with multiple variables and out in, in input and outcome parameters, students need to make trade-offs uh, when they're dealing with multiple variables. And um, come up with design heuristics, which has been uh, seen that it's a part of the expert design process. Experts use design heuristics to form ideas and proceed with the engineering design task. And of course, like with every design challenge, there's certain amount of uncertainty inbuilt into the design task. There are constraints which are not clearly defined. There's a scope which has to be uh, properly defined. So having students engage with this process was their core idea behind this study. And and also, like there's, there's literature which calls for making students engineering able. So not necessarily making everyone engineers, but 
having them practice the engineering thinking skills so that um, students who are interested in engineering or they get interested in engineering. And at the center of all these practices and skills is the framework of productive disciplinary engagement, which is what I'll be using um, in, in my study to understand this design process which the students are um, doing in the classroom. So what do I mean by productive disciplinary engagement? It's, it's a framework which has been primarily used in science inquiry, and that helps us understand how new ideas and disciplinary understand, understandings occur within real life settings. So here the real life setting is the classroom setting. So when I say engagement, I mean are the students working on tasks? Uh, are they contributing to and are attending to each other's ideas? Um, is there an overlap between the issues which they are talking about and the disciplinary discourse? And when I say productive disciplinary engagement as a whole, it means is, are the students making progress towards the, towards the design goal? Um, in this case, the design optimization was the goal. So are they making a progress towards that goal? And that's a continuous process. Um, the framework which guides this study uh, is built on three major bodies of work. Uh, first one being um, using models as advanced organizers for training students for future learning. So we need to, uh, some literature suggests that if we, uh, if we use physical models uh, before showing them real challenges, students are better prepared to handle those real challenges. Um, then, uh, coming to the case of physical models, these are simpler representations of complex systems. So in this case, uh, the plumbing model, I've simplified that to a manageable set of variables. So I'm not dealing with the entire, set, entire range of plumbing variables. I have narrowed it down to three input and two outcome uh, parameters. Here. The three input being pipe length, pipe diameter, and pipe bend, and the outcome being pr uh, pressure and cost. And then, of course, um, coming to the worked example literature, which suggests that showing worked example before they get to solving real challenges actually helps them solve the real challenges in a more efficient way. And then it, within worked examples, there are different types of worked examples. So I, I based my study on complete worked example, which shows that showing them multiple examples of a complete um, solution actually helps them proceed with the task. And then com incomplete example has also been uh, seen to be useful, but usually complete and incomplete example both tend to focus students more on the solutions which have been given to them. So in kind of like six states. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to the third type of worked example is the negative worked example, which is showing a counter example. Uh, so my, my design of improvable models, the board which I gave to you is an instance of that particular uh, it is an instance of improvable model, but design is based on these literature. Um, so it's it's a complete example. It shows a counter example actually. It's not showing a, a good design. It's showing a bad design, and it's asking you to improve that bad design and make progress towards an optimal solution. Um, so my research questions are: How do students use these improvable models, and how does the use of these models as priming artifacts? influence uh, the engineering solutions? And what type of scaffolds and instructions uh, do we need to help students understand such types of models? And in this study, I have focused on two types of improvable models. The first one I'm calling it suboptimal system model. The one I gave you is, a, is an example of suboptimal system model. And the second one I'm calling an optimal component model. So it's a partial solution, it's not complete, but the partial solution that is given is the most efficient one. I'll just uh, show you examples of both those things. And my context, my design context is designing the plumbing system. Uh, so the design challenge being design an optimal plumbing system as cheaply as you can, uh, satisfying the pressure constraint. So exactly the design challenge which I gave you. Uh, that was the same challenge as the students worked on. The input parameters and the outcome parameters are, are those and uh, this was the model which I gave you. So in terms of uh, the suboptimal design decisions, there were a lot of pipe bends. There were uh, lots of one inch pipes. Um, and the pressure uh, at two of the taps, tap B and tap C, they were not meeting the pressure requirements. So there were lots of design decisions which were inbuilt into the model 
which, uh, which were suboptimal design decisions. The second type of model uh, which I gave the kids was optimal compound. So here you see the, the water source being connected with tap B. Uh, tap A and tap C are not connected. But this is the best uh, combination of pipes and the best route that you can use to connect water source with tap B. So this was the second model which uh, they got. And uh, the groups either got one, so either got suboptimal system model or they got top of the component. Um, and the classroom context here are two sixth grade classrooms, uh, 25 students uh, divided into small groups um, like you guys did. And the two treatments are assigned randomly to the classes. And this was the instructional plan. Uh, broadly, it spanned uh, eight days, but those eight days were spread across a month, uh, like a, one, once per week. And I started by connecting with the prior knowledge about the engineering system what they know about good or bad plumbing system. And then from there proceeded on to explaining the science behind the plumbing system, science of uh, the water pressure. And there's, then there's a simulation that they use um, to actually understand um, the relationship between pipe length, pipe diameter, um, the cost, and the water pressure drop. I'll show you a demo of the simulation as well. And then they start to work on the design challenge, and finally they give a presentation and receive feedback both from the students as well as the teacher. Um, let me see if I can play this. Um, and this will give you an idea of the classroom context. So this is exactly the design which you guys uh, got to start with. Uh, why it's on a paper is because once they start modifying this, they needed to have a reference of the initial design. So I gave printouts of these so that they could focus on that. Oops. I just fast forward. Okay, so you get an idea. Um, so there was a lot of conversation going on in the, in the groups about what's wrong with the model that was given to them and how they could improve it. And in the process, they were also comparing the models, which is really important when they are uh, doing the design task, to see that what has changed between the model that has been given to them and their current design. So in terms of data sources, uh, there was video data. You saw an audio recorder that was kind of a backup for the cameras in case they failed. Uh, the models created by the teams uh, and student written work and my personal observation notes in the classroom. And in terms of the prompts and scaffolds, um, I divided the prompts into three different types, procedural, reflective, and disciplinary. Uh, kind of like focusing on different aspects of the interaction uh, of the students with the teachers. So first one being uh, helping the students make progress with the design class, understanding the challenge then reflect on the uh, on their solutions and then keeping them focused on the discipline uh, disciplinary practices and there were also technology scaffolds so there was a software simulator like i mentioned um, and an ipad with which they could record the design changes um, this is a demo of the software simulator which they use so they could see they could lay out the pipes and see how the pressure is dropping across each pipe segment and uh, this was before they came to the design challenge. And 
they could select a joint, branch out of it, or they could remove a pipe and then like replace that with a different diameter pipe and see how the pressure changes across all the pipe segments. Okay, so coming to the interesting part, finally. How do students use improvable models? So they used it as objects of modification, uh, developing and sharing ideas, forming new ideas, and refining existing ideas, and also for decomposing the design challenge. So they broke down the design challenge into smaller components, which they could then uh, kind of deal with. And in terms of the disciplinary practices evidenced by the students, um, I saw six uh, practices coming out. Um, so they were definitely doing a lot of mathematical calculations. Uh, they were, then they were focusing on individual parameters, uh, not making connections, um, as well as making connections between single input and an outcome parameter. Then they were making trade-offs, so trade-offs both in terms of uh, the relationship between input and multiple outcome parameters and also weighing the outcome parameters. Do they lay more emphasis on reducing the cost or do they lay uh, more emphasis on meeting the pressure requirements or like, maximizing the pressure? And then finally, like having a set of rules um, to guide the design process. And um, so in terms of the distribution of these disciplinary practices, we see on the left, on the left so this is a distribution of uh, both the classes. So it's irrespective of the treatment. We see that there is uh, a lot of DIs. So there's a lot of focus on individual parameters uh, going on. Um, but if you move to the right, is the distribution when students were actually using the improvable models, we see that the percentage of uh, trade-offs and heuristics goes up. Now if we focus on just one class which was using the optimal component model, we see that they engage with um, a lot of, they make a lot of uh, connection between single parameters, so one input and one outcome parameter, uh, but they also do a lot of, um, uh, they, they also do uh, trade-offs as well. And then if you move on to the other classroom which started working with the suboptimal system model, the one which I gave you, we see that there's now uh, heuristics being generated and used. And of course there's uh, the other disciplinary practices as well, so there's trade-offs uh, both in both in terms of parameters and uh, weighing the outcomes. And then uh, narrowing down on the design heuristics, so there were six different types of heuristics which were generated by the students. So for example, placing pipes along the middle, uh, let's use a direct path, um, use three quarter inch pipes, remain low, like on the lower part of the board, design board, don't use one inch pipes, have the least bands. I saw some of these come up in your discussions as well in the short time frame. So these are kind of things which the students were generating while seeing the improvable models and focusing on the on the uh, on the suboptimal design decisions which were visually represented. And then they also decompose the design challenge. So these were the final models created by the students in the suboptimal system uh, group sort of like similar to some of the teams, I think. In the optimal component class, I saw design fixation happening, but there were, there were also three types. So uh, one of the teams immediately, uh, when, they got the, when they got the OC model, the optimal component model, they simply said, just connect it using more pipes. So they were simply interested in extending the model that was given to them. Mm -hmm. And they did not think about replacing uh, the pipes and going for a different path. The other team, uh, Team OCB, uh, they kind of took apart the design that I had given them, but later on, so 467, 476 and 477, those are the transcript line numbers. So later on in the design process, they came back to the original design uh, because they found that the, the model that I had given them was more uh, efficient in terms of cost than the ones which they had built. 
So it's it's like a de delayed fixation happening. And then there's the other team, Team OCA, which had an implicit fixation, uh, where the team did not explicitly come back to the design, but the final design was very similar to the one that I had given them. So here are the three uh, type three three designs, three final designs. And uh, if you see the at the two arrows which are showing you that segment of the the model, it's very similar. It comes up. Okay, it's very similar to the original model which I have given them. Same number of one-inch pipes and similar pipe path. In terms of productive disciplinary engagement, where they're making progress was with the design task. Um, if you focus on the first class, um, SS the ones using the suboptimal system model. Here we see that they are consistently, uh, the, there's a bump in between in terms of like the cost going up, but then they figure out ways of reducing the cost and making it more optimal. The average final cost for this class was um, $17.89. Now if you look at the other class, um, their average final cost was 2009 and they engage with fewer equations than this, the other group. So in terms of, um, in terms of the scaffolds and prompts, I earlier said that I had given them uh, three kinds of prompts. And the purpose of giving those prompts was trying to figure out what, what prompt is more likely to lead them towards the productive engagement. What I found was there was like the combination of all the three prompts were needed at different stages of the design. So there was not just one particular type of prompt which was useful. And these prompts, the combination of these prompts helped by problematizing the design solution, uh, by giving students authority, making them accountable for the design uh, solutions that they're coming up with, and by providing resources. So kind of like giving them prompts when they're getting stuck and moving them along. Um, in terms of conclusion, kind of going back to uh, some of the findings, uh, we saw that the students were engaging productively with the disciplinary practices, and they were focusing on the counter examples which are visually represented in the models, uh, and coming up with design heuristics. The, the group which worked with the optimal component model, they fixated on the optimal, part, the partially optimal design, uh, but that actually helped them move along the design process. And then we also saw the combination of the three different types of prompts being useful. Um, and this study, like the, the lesson plan which came out of this study along with these scaffolds, were, were used for another year by the teachers themselves. Like I wasn't part of that run. They adapted the lesson plan for their, their use and they kind of uh, have now made it part of their curricular process and curricular um, framework. And they've customized it as per their needs. Now, in terms of future work, um, I said at the very beginning that students have to deal with uncertain, uh, uncertainty that is inherent in the design challenges. Um, what emerged from the data, which is not uh, part of this presentation, was, was the fact that some of the students were very comfortable engaging with the uncertainty. Like, they, they did not ask me what, what, what I wanted out of them. They were like, OK, um, they had a justification for how much pressure they thought was optimal and how much cost they thought was an optimal uh, value. And sp these students are better at decision making in terms of they were much more richer dis discussions happening. So that's something which I want to investigate further in terms of future work, like how does the uncertainty um, have an influence on the design process and what kind of productive discipline engagement does that particular aspect of the design process support? And then can we use design heuristics as a bridge between science and engineering? Can, can that be the connection between science inquiry and design thinking? And then also like there's literature which suggests that if students themselves build the negative examples, uh, then they engage with critical self-evaluation. But the question is like, are the sixth graders ready for that sort of interaction? Uh, and also the form factor. Right now, I've mostly I've used the physical model. What if the suboptimal model was a computer-generated model? Um, the benefit might be that it would give faster feedback, like quicker feedback to the students when they are modifying the model. 
but then is, is immediate feedback actually useful in that case? Because right now there is like a delay in the feedback that they're getting. The feedback here is mostly after they calculate the cost and the pressure. So, uh, so kind of like seeing whether that's useful or not. So all the key people who helped me um, formulate this research, uh, thank you. I have some time for questions. Yes, please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm curious, did you keep in contact with the teachers? You said that they yeah, I'm still modified and figured. Mm -hmm. What kind of modifications did they make for the, the next year? Um, so next year, uh, they wanted to kind of give hands-on experience with the science part of it. Because right now, uh, what we did was use the flex simulation from your Colorado, uh, your border. And uh, they wanted to give a more, the teachers wanted a more hands on experience. So they devised their own experiments uh, where students could see how the pressure changed when they used different types of pipes uh, by, run, by using it like different pipes under the, the sink and seeing how the water flow was different. So they incorporated that into the, the mm -hmm. lesson plan. And I sat with them during the modification process because they wanted to you know, like stick with the broader idea of using the improvable models, but kind of fine tune it a little bit based on what the students needed in the classroom. So that was an example of the, uh, the modification. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So here I calculate, like for me, the equation was whenever the students calculated the cost. Uh, because before calculating the cost, they were making a lot of changes where uh, the pressure would keep on varying because they were trying to, uh, they were trying to satisfy the 10 PSI constraint. Uh, once they got the 10 PSI constraint and they satisfied that, then they calculated the cost. So I took like, uh, I took cost to be my threshold for one iteration. So every time the calculated cost was a new iteration for me. Um, even for the students, uh, I had instructed them like every time they calculate the cost, they needed to take a picture of the models they had. So that was a sense of iteration for them as well. Uh, and then coming to your point about one class did more iteration than the other, it was up to the students how many iterations they wanted to do. So whenever they felt that they had reached the optimal solution from their perspective, then they would stop. But they had to justify why that was the optimal solution. So one class thought that they had reached the optimal solution uh, earlier than the other class. Um, and that's something which I want to, pers like that's also kind of part of uh, the reanalysis of the data that I'm doing right now, figuring out like what was different in the two classrooms which led the students to believe they were done. Yeah. Um so the group So this one? Yeah. Um they actually went online to figure out what was the ideal water pressure, mm -hmm. like in an actual house. And um, and this cost is uh, based on like real cost of materials from in Home Depot, like kind of scaled down to the model size. But they went online early on in the design process to figure out what's an ideal pressure in the house. And uh, I mean, it cannot give you like a causal evidence of that, but that might have influenced them to make some design decisions, which uh, they figured out. Okay, this is the optimal cost. And if I stick with this, I can reduce, uh, this is my optimal pressure. If I stick with this, I can reduce the cost as well. Um, and that might have influenced the design process. How old were 
the students? Uh, these are sixth graders, so like about 11, 12 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. you call the Right, as a control case. So, what do you think what happens for the operation of cost or time based? So, you know, we're all yeah, yeah. here is cost mm -hmm. number of operation. So, one of the things. Um, which has been, so there are a couple of papers looking into this aspect as well. And in turn, it relates to this study, um, is that when students start with an example which, uh, which gives them a solution, they're already kind of jump-starting the design process. Mm -hmm. As compared if they start with a blank design goal. So essentially, in that control case, I would be asking them, here's a blank slate, now start building. And that takes them more time to uh, get to the critical iterations. That's what the papers mm -hmm. have called them. The critical iterations are where they are engaging actively with the uh, design mm -hmm. challenge. So mm -hmm. if I get them the blind design board, um, they would take more time to reach those critical iterations. Uh, whereas with these uh, examples, I'm kind of jump-starting that process. But that would definitely be another uh, study for sure, with them having control case. Is there a question? But to, to, jump, uh, to build on what uh, you think that when you give students a, a, a solution already, there's a temptation simply to tinker with that solution. The fixation that happens. Well, uh, and, and in a sense, but well, in the real world, that often new products are simply variations. Mm -hmm. so in that sense, it is authentic, but it depends, I guess, on what you're trying to count. <coughs> yeah, so in, 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 in the class, I got the partial solution. That's kind of like what happened, because they, they stuck with the model that I grew up And they didn't, uh, they didn't engage with a lot of iterations in terms of like modifying the model. Mm -hmm. um, but the other example is that if they had rather the, the model that you got, they knew that if they stuck with it, it was a bad design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they knew that they had to yeah. modify it. It was kind of like explicitly um, visible to them. Mm -hmm. Another question here? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Sign up sheets. If you haven't signed up, make sure you signed up. You get those back. And please eat food. And if any of your research, oh, and of course, for everyone, if your research interests, uh, you know, like match with mine or similar, I'm happy and open for collaboration. So I get work done. So what was the idea? They probably don't
Courses in the evening on how to use the supercomputer. So I tried to help grad students use well, the supercomputers. Going back, what's your name? Yeah, I'm Thomas Kessler. Nice to meet you. So I'm. So I uh, retired in 2012, and we we live just off campus. So we come looking for lectures on. Rebecca, we were over in physics. We were over in physics, and Rebecca was over there, and she said this was happening. So we came over with her. So you're here as a postdoc? Yeah, I'm here as a postdoc. I joined in September. Good. Yeah, good. Well, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. I guess I'll just sign out of here. Okay. You got your USB back. Yes. That's important. Um, 